Um, one last question for you, um, Terry. About the gift economy, what's wrong with money? Okay, so the, 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 there are a number of things wrong with money. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to know where to begin with it. One of the things about money is this, okay. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, t I'll talk about two major things that are wrong with money. One is that the fact that you've got money and are able to buy things means that other people have to work for money in order to get their needs met. Now, what that means is that they they have to be part be participants in a in a market. They have to orient their. I mean, let's let's leave aside this the, the capitalist firm for the moment and just talk about even if it was a a collective of people, they still have to get their needs met by by working for money so so what so so what that means is that um their their labor is alienated what they don't because they're having to do the things that make money they don't have the choice to do the things that a they think are exciting and fun to do or b they think are useful and necessary and they don't have the choice as to how to distribute what they do what they, what they're producing because ultimately it has to go to the people who can pay for it yeah. Right. So that's the first thing that's wrong with money. Money and alienated labour, as Marx calls it, are, are, are like two two peas in a pot. You know, like joined at the hip. Right. The, the the second thing is that if you if you have a monetary economy and 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 a market econ an economy, the logic of the, the of of money is always that it makes logical sense for you to um buy cheap and sell dear yeah right in other words that's what makes the market efficient you know when people praise the market that's exactly what they're talking about in other words if someone's producing widgets for for 200 and you can buy a widget for 150 dollars, then you will always buy it with, for 150 dollars. if if your purchases were systematically random in other words another one came up for $300 this week you'd buy that and the next week you'd buy the one for $60 and the week after the one for $1,000 money would have no use money would be useless right the only thing that makes money useful in a market work is buying cheap and selling dear it has to be in, in Foucault's terms it has to be a dominant hegemonic discourse of the market economy is buying cheap and selling dear most people most of the time not all of the time have to operate it that discourse in order for money to be effective now with with that practice comes a, a particular and, and somewhat obvious problem which is that the the things what it means is that it doesn't make sense it always makes sense to make the best monetary decision and not a decision based upon use values so money, the, getting the most money is called getting the most exchange value out of your transaction, whereas getting the most use value out of it can, can be a variety of things. So what, what, what it means, we know, we know this in the way how capitalist firms operate, profit's always more important to them in the long, at the bottom line than environmental needs, than the needs of the poor and the needs of the people working for them you know, like whether or not their workers are bored is of less importance to them than whether or not they're making a profit. And this is not something, this is not because of a culture of greed. It's mistaken to think that. It's not about that at all. It's about if they don't behave in that way, they lose out in the market and they ultimately lose their, their dough. You know, yeah. basically, if, you don't, if you're not making decisions based on profit, you will ultimately go broke, go bankrupt, you lose your dough, et cetera, et cetera. And this applies at every level, whether you're a big business, a big cooperative, an, an individual family household or whatever. Like, for example, a mother who goes shopping, right, in the supermarket, she looks at the rows of shelves and she sees that fair trade coffee is going to be $9 for 250 grams and, and cheap Woolworths coffee is going to be $6 and it's just as good as a fair trade. She thinks, if I... Yeah, it'd be good to spend this money on the fair trade coffee. But but look, what that means is that I deprive my family of various other things that they could have if I saved that $3 and used it for some other other purpose. 
in a sense, she's not, she's making a decision that's no different to the big business, which is saying, I could treat all this wastewater really effectively with a big tailings dam, but that'd cost me another 50% what the current tailings dam does, or I could, or I could make a tailings dam that's adequate for 70 years out of 75 and, and put that in place and, and people will think it's all right. And then the 75th year, it spills and there's mercury in all of the rivers and the fish die. They're making a very similar decision on basically any kind of market economy or monetary economy has that problem. There's no mm -hmm. way to both have money and the market and not to have that problem. And, and the reason I think why a lot of permaculture people can't see that is that at an individual level, you can always make a choice to buy, to buy deer and sell cheap. Like what I mean by that is you can go into the shop and you can buy the fair trade coffee for $9 and you think it's an open choice. The money, there's nothing wrong with the monetary system. It depends on people's ethics. Mm. But actually, that's not the case. If, if everybody starts behaving ethically and using their money only ethically, money ceases to have any meaning or use. You can't have it both ways. And so what, what we find in society is that these um, personal choices or, or, or political choices or moral choices that people make to use money differently are a minority practice. Yeah. And essentially they remain a minority practice because money as such is, is dependent upon, upon the discourse of buying cheap and selling dear. It ceases to have any meaning. Like I have, I have used this example... Oh, this is a mad example. Oh, I don't think I'll go into it. It's too hard to explain verbally. But anyway, okay. uh, it's, it's about two co to, uh, cooperative, right? A, co a cooperative is I'm trying to remember it. Yeah, a cooperative is making steel, right? And they decide that the, the usual ton of steel is, they're going to sell it for $2,000. That's a normal market price. Yeah. However, the workers in this cooperative decide for ethical reasons that they're going to sell their ton of steel to a village in Africa that can only pay $500. Right. Okay, so they make that decision. So they're all out of pocket by $1,500, but they say, yeah, no worries. Why are they not worried? They're not worried because they want to spend their money that they make from the steel on guitar amps made by another company, also an ethical collective. The, their, the other ethical collective is going to sell them $2,000 worth of amplifiers. Why? Because they're into heavy metal, which is this other collective's aesthetic choice. And so they decide we're going to let these people, the steel makers, have that the, 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 the guitar amps for $500, even though the normal price is $2,000. Okay. This, is, this, this is a situation in which people are not operating according to the discourse of buying cheap and selling dear. What can we say about this situation? First of all, because money in this situation has no meaning or relevance, it ceases to be relevant. In other words, the only way to make decisions in a situation that's that unpredictable is by meeting together and deciding what you're going to allocate to another group and what you're going to get from another group. In other words, the gift economy, right? Yeah. It, and the second thing you could say about it is it, it means it's a massively unpredictable and in, inefficient situation. Where is the market economy operating according to the, the discourse of buying cheap and selling dear works? This other fanciful scenario doesn't actually work. Mm -hmm. So it's like if you drive permaculture ethics to the point where you think what are the logical implications, then the logical implications are if you start, if everyone starts operating according to permaculture ethics, money will have no meaning and will be dispensed with because it doesn't work. <laughs> So if you believe that, you'll believe anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so all I'd say about that is it's interesting. I don't. I do believe it in a way because I'm seeing this with um, maybe because we're in a become more wealthy, but the, the next generation 
so my second son said he would shovel shit if he liked his boss. And I was yeah. like, wow. And in many ways, it, it, he really, that generation really care about the, their relationship, feeling valued in their job. And so they are things you can't put a price on. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just listen to that and I think you're talking about a very middle class family. And I know he was a cleaner. He's a cleaner. Um, yeah, so yeah, but come so on. Hard. He comes from a middle class yeah. family background. Like it's like yeah, he's got Yeah, true. You guys, culturally, he's got you guys behind you and and and, and that's well, one thing I'd say home. about he's oh, living and, on his own. Yeah. And the second thing I'd say is we all thought that. Remember before the last election, all of the left were going around saying, oh, the next generation, climate change is their issue and so on. And look what the bloody happened. Oh, Workers think... voted with their feet against the, the Labor Party that they thought was r risking their, their jobs and their standard of living by being too radical on climate change. Mm. But were those workers young people? Yeah, of course they were. There was no big difference. It wasn't no young people all suddenly voted for the, you no. Know. Mm. There wasn't a huge, I mean, there may have been a marginal difference, but it wasn't like. Well, maybe if we can take ourselves back to the 80s, I think we were pretty, um, greed is good motto and we would work really hard and long hours. Yeah. If even if we didn't like the boss and we didn't feel valued, we just do things for the money. Uh, I'd like to. The way, the way yeah. I look at it is this. Okay. So what, what happened between the fifties and the seventies was that in the rich countries, we had huge social welfare. We had full employment. When I say full employment, like nothing like what we've got now. And, you know, much more real full employment we've got, we've got now partially, you know, looks like full employment, but it's not actually. Um, and we had all this reliable social welfare and, and, and full employment and council housing in many countries of the world and all sorts of backstops for the poor, for the, for the poor in the rich countries. And what happened then, there were huge, there were lots of riots. There was the French uprising in 1968. There were huge masses of strikes and wildcat strikes, and there was even, there was left wing terrorism, you know, like Bader Meinhof gang and so on, and it's Italy people going around and kneecapping employers, you know, with with guns. Um, the capitalist class was extremely worried, you know, like, and and more and more more and more of the social product was being taken away by the state, you know, like by state enterprises of various kinds. So what did they do? They worked out that their way to deal with this problem was to ship manufacturing into poor wage countries. And, and by, by 1975, that was technically possible. It hadn't been before. And they did that. And they broke the, that power of that working class group. Mm. And, I, and I tend to think we're only, we'd only get back to that situation. I don't know. Or what do I think about that? I, I, I basically think it's very it's very hard to to develop a, a militant opposition or working class that demand huge changes in a situation of globalization. You know? Yeah. And and, and and in a sense we need to be even more radical to move to the next step rather than thinking that a social welfare kind of social democracy sort of thing can solve our problems and going back to that. We can't go back to that is probably what I'm saying. Why can't we go back to that? Because, because of globalisation. Because the minute, you know, like in Australia, like the classic of the last election, the Labor Party in Australia can't be more radical than up to a certain point because we lose our, our industry to, to other low-wage countries. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Lots of food for thought. Well, thank yeah. you. That's all I had. <laughs> what we could do. Right. I mean, what what do you see are the strengths of the gift economy? Oh well, I think it allows people to to be creative. 
It makes it easy to make environmentally sound choices. Um, it allows people to, in everyday work, to express their feelings of compassion and friendship to other people. Mm. What's your elevator speech for the gift economy? How do you sell the gift economy? The gift economy is, is a society without money where people organise in voluntary clubs to produce the things that they need and, 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 and make arrangements and uh, promises to give to other people to make this a more stable arrangement. Mm, thank you. <laughs> All right. I'll leave you with that then. Thanks. Okay.